In 2004, on that one day, 30,000 tsunamis hit in 14 different countries around the Indian Ocean. 30 tsunamis in one day. The first one was started by a 9.0 earthquake on the Richter scale. You can imagine that these tsunamis, and that's an actual photo, that is not photoshopped, devastated and ravaged 14 countries. It is estimated that nearly 230,000 people lost their lives to these tsunamis that day. From the towering waves over the millions of gallons of water that just rushed and drove through the life and the homes of so many people. These tsunamis became known as the Boxing Day Tsunamis because it was blow after blow after blow that kept on hitting those same countries and lands. Those who were on the beaches and the coastlines didn't even see it coming. The waters just started to rise. In fact, in four seconds, it was reported that the water rose four meters in just four seconds. You can imagine to get those waves how much more it needed to raise. There was no special scientific gadget or thing to measure and to see and to forecast this tsunami or these tsunamis coming. So nobody could be prepared. The only thing that they could see and hear was if somebody was out higher ground and they were shouting, hurry, run! That was the only sign that they could have. So those who heard the warnings and heeded the warnings scrambled as fast as they could to higher ground or to the highest point that they could reach. They knew that every single second that they lost would probably result in tragedy. Therefore, if they looked back to witness the tsunami and the magnificence of that tsunami and the water and something that they have never seen before, maybe to take out their video camera, that's why there's not much video or photos of this, they probably would be one of the statistics. I share this with you for two reasons. First reason is that I mentioned today marks the first Sunday of Advent. The beginning of a new church year. And here on this first Sunday of Advent, we look back to when Jesus came as our first king. But a lot of the emphasis for this first Sunday at Advent is looking really at the second coming of Christ when destruction will come. Just like we look back to the four Sundays of end time where we looked closely at many different ways of Christ our king coming and the last judgment and what that looks like. Advent means he comes. He comes to bring us hope. He comes to bring us hope and destruction. He comes to give us hope on the impending destruction that is coming on the last day. Our Lord continuously reminds us that he came on Christmas to live among us, to be our savior, and to give us eternal hope. The Lord as well continuously reminds us that he is also coming his second time as the judge of the living and the dead as we confess in the Apostles' Creed. So the second reason why I shared this with you, the story of the, I'm trying to remember what I called it again, the Boxing Day Tsunamis. The Boxing Day Tsunamis, the 14 tsunamis, or the 30 tsunamis in 14 countries, is because the biblical account that we're going to study from the Old Testament today. It's all about looking back or looking forward. We look to Genesis chapter 19. If you want to open up your Bibles, I don't have the pew page number there for you, but Genesis chapter 19 is what we're going to look in depth at during this morning's sermon. And here in this lesson, we're going to see how Jesus God brings powerful judgment as it burns towards Sodom and Gomorrah. Is this the type of judgment that we want to avoid? Absolutely. So today, God reminds us to avoid his coming impending judgment on his second coming. 
Number one, his judgment burns and it purifies. And number two, it separates and it saves. That first verse, 15, from chapter 19. With the coming of dawn, the angels urged Lot, saying, Hurry, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, or you will be swept away when the city is punished. Before this early morning hour took place, and all, all this angel speak to Lot and Abraham, there was something that happened the night right before. Several events that led up to the angel's warning Lot. The evening before, the angels approached the gate to Sodom and Gomorrah. And Lot was there, sitting there at the gate. And Lot there at the gate said, Oh, your guest, please come. And he had a sense that these were not normal individuals, not just normal men. But these were angels as the Lord's servants. So he invited them to his home. And the angel said, No, 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 we'll just sleep in the court courtyard there in the city. But Lot insisted, please come. I want to feed you. I want to give you a warm place to stay. When they got there, all the other males of the city followed because they were intrigued who these guests were. And so they followed along and were surrounding the house because they wanted to have their way with the angels who looked like men. Remember, this was an immoral society, a very sexual, immoral city, and they wanted to have their way with these men. So Lot prevented them by inviting them into the house. He didn't want them to harm the angels. And in every way he could, he pulled the angels in, but then he couldn't stop them. So the angels used their extra power and pulled Lot in, slammed the door and locked it, and then miraculously struck all the men that were approaching the house with blindness. It was at this time that the angels then encouraged Lot to gather his family because they're going to be leaving the city. Because major judgment was coming. This was Lot's home. Remember, Lot actually chose this section of land from the promised land. He chose the better land, and Abraham got the lesser land. Lot loved this land. It was flowing with milk and honey. It was very fertile, very prosperous, but it was also very sinful and very immoral. He had lived there for several years and he had gotten used to it and didn't want to just up and leave what he's familiar with. No matter what the case, Lot had an attachment to Sodom and Gomorrah. And so did his family. In fact, his sons-in-laws, his son-in-laws, didn't want to leave either. So they actually left and went to be with all the other people in the city and left the family so that they could stay there. But Lot gathered his family, his wife and his two daughters, and he didn't hesitate. But when he did, the men grasped his hand in the hands of his wife and of his two daughters and led them safely out of the city, for the Lord was merciful to them. Lot just didn't want to leave. He was so used to it. He didn't want to go to an unfamiliar place. He didn't want this damage and destruction to happen to his beloved city even though he knew it was bad and sinful. But he needed an extra hand, one of the Lord's messengers, an angel, to pull them out and lead them and his family away. We all have our families and our friends and our homes and familiarities too. It's hard to be told to just drop everything, to leave it all behind and to desert it. When it comes to God's judgment, this is exactly what we need to do. Even though we may be attached to our material things, God commands us to hurry away from all of our temptations to avoid his coming judgment. But it's not that easy, is it? 
How often do we have temptations, just regular temptations in our life, and we don't run from those and desert them if they cause us to, tempt, to be fallen into temptation? We are comfortable in the way we live. We don't want to leave the life that we have, the family that we have, but rather we want to enhance it and add more material things to it. Don't we? Isn't that the true American way? It's so easy to fall into that trap. If you ever gone shopping on Black Friday, which, guilty, I go on Black Friday, I think you know what I mean. All the material things, all the things that people rush to get. It doesn't really happen here in Lubbock, but people trample one another to get an item that their life is not depending on. We can easily fall in love with our things. We need to flee from these things too, just like Lot needed to. Look at what the angel said. Flee for your lives. Don't look back and don't stop anywhere in the plain. Flee to the mountains or you will be swept away. This wasn't just a request from God. Oh, Lot, please come. Oh, Lot, if you want to, you can come with us. No, the angels say, flee. Don't look back. Don't stop. Flee to the mountains or you will be swept away. The angel is saying, do it or else. Resist it or else. Desert it or else. Move forward or else. Don't look back. Don't be attached to your things. Or else you will be swept away. Swept away isn't really that strong of terminology. It doesn't come across that strong. It's a little gentle. Listen again how God's judgment takes place. Then the Lord rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. Thus he overthrew those cities and the entire plain, destroying all those living in the cities and also the vegetation in the land. God's coming judgment, I think we can all agree, is not a light sweeping away. I'm just brushing the floor. God's coming judgment is a burning wrath that is poured down on all who have sinned and who have not followed his every command and who have not trusted him. If you, For a moment you're thinking that, well, I'm not as bad as Sodom and Gomorrah. We're not as bad as Sodom and Gomorrah. Listen to a couple of these quotes. Bill Bright says this, if America insists on being the major exporter of pornography, the major importer of drugs, and promotes immoral degeneracy, she will pay a price. I think we can agree that God cannot tolerate us any further. Billy Graham said this, unless God chastens America, he will have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. This is the society that we live in. We live in Sodom and Gomorrah. This is what we are surrounded with. This is what our children are now growing up with. The Lord raining down burning sulfur on us is coming soon. But with fire there is a glimmer of hope. Fire destroys, but it also purifies. If it wouldn't be for wildfires in our forests, there would never be any fresh new growth. If it wouldn't be for the thousand degree burning vats, we wouldn't have purified metals. If it wouldn't be for God's fiery wrath, we wouldn't be cleansed. By God's wrath, Jesus Christ's death purified us from all our sins. By God's judgment, Jesus Christ was declared guilty 
And we have been justified freely, not guilty by his grace. By God's coming judgment. The world and all its unbelievers will be destroyed by fire. But we, believers, will be purified eternally because of Jesus' sacrifice cleansing blood. God's coming judgment is coming soon. It will destroy by fire and many will never believe it's coming. They don't even see it's coming. Just like the tsunami. God has made us ready by warning us through his word that we should not be consumed and burned in its wrath, but rather be purified as we trust in his son and in his guiding hand, just like the angels guiding Lot out of his home. God has also made us ready by warning us that his judgment is there to separate and to save us. Look at his next words. I want to show you this in a second. I, I skipped the, the next words. There's a chart coming up on the next slide, and I don't want to miss that. God has made us ready for his judgment because he has prepared us by creating faith in our hearts at baptism and nurturing that faith through his word and through his sacraments of his body and blood. Every single time we receive his body and blood, every single time that we remember his baptism that he gave to us, we are purified once again. We are cleansed and we are brought closer to him and purified in the fires of his love. Jesus' second coming is coming soon. But the celebration of his first coming is already here, and that's why we're here in Advent. Abraham knew long ago that the Lord was with him. The Lord had promised him that he would have as many descendants as the stars in the sky and the sands on the seashore. And then what happened? From his line, from his descendants, you see Jesus. That is why we can be called the children of Abraham. And we sing the song, Father Abraham. Because it connects us to Jesus and what he has done for us. Abraham looked forward to trusting and, and trusted in this promise that God gave him. That those descendants would bring about the purification of his soul. The purification of his sin and wash him clean. And because he believed, God credited it to him as righteousness. We, like Abraham, trust in the promise of the Savior. But instead of looking forward to his first coming, we look back to the promises that he has already come and was born of Mary. And so with Abraham, we trust boldly like him. He sat there knowing that the judgment was coming upon Lot and his family and all of Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham pleaded to the Lord. Oh, he pleaded so boldly and he prayed so boldly. Six times, in fact, that the Lord would spare him. And he counted down from number. If there's only 50 righteous people, Lord, will you save the city? And God agreed every single time. And then finally it comes down to, if there's only 10 righteous people, Lord, will you save and spare the city? And God said, yes, if there's only 10. But in the end, God still overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah because there were not even 10 righteous people or believers in the city. But God's grace shines through. Because he still saves Lot, his wife, and his two daughters. Four in all. And I don't think we can even say four righteous people. He overthrew those cities and the entire plain, destroying all those living in the cities and also the vegetation in the land. Nothing was spared except these four people. And then look at the next verse, verse 26. But Lot's wife looked back and she became a pillar of salt. 
Only three remained. How tempted are we to look back and not always follow the Lord's commands to the T? The devil is always working on us. He draws us closer and closer to our things, to our homes, to our sins, and away from God. But Lot's wife looked back and she became a pillar of salt. It's impossible to follow the Lord, our leader, if we look back. Just try it someday. Try following God by looking away from him. Try follow somebody while keeping your head turned to the opposite direction. We must not look back. If we do, we will be swallowed up in the burning sulfuric flames of God's wrath. Luke 9 says this, No one having put the hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Once we start to follow Jesus, we must never look back. We must give up our old way of life to find a new life in Christ our Savior who has come. Sure, we will be separated from our previous life, our previous way of life. We will be separated from a corrupt society. We will be separated, yes, from even family members and friends. We will be separated from our material things. But we will be spared as Lot and his two daughters were spared. All because of God's rich mercy and grace. The story continues. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and returned to the place where he had stood before the Lord. He looked it down toward Sodom and Gomorrah, toward all of the land of the plain, and he saw dense smoke rising from the land like smoke from a furnace. So when God destroyed the cities of the plain, he remembered Abraham, and he brought Lot out of the catastrophe that overthrew the cities where Lot had lived. Did you catch it? God remembers those who put their trust in him. Yes, God will always carry out his plan, but he also will always accomplish what he desires. God remembers you. When we pray and plead to God for mercy, to spare our loved ones for the sake of his mercy, he hears us. Lot was caught up in a terrible society, a very immoral society. Dear friends, we are also caught up in a terrible, immoral, sinful society that could easily be compared to Sodom and Gomorrah, if not worse. But God is still with us. God still remembers us. God will always hear us and watch over us to save us. Jesus came into this world to save souls. He has come into this world to protect his people, to protect us, to save us. As his coming judgment is right around the corner, we will never forget why he came into this world. We will not look back and turn into a pillar of salt like Lot's wife, but we'll continue to keep our eyes forward at our leader who died on the cross. With him, guiding us with his hand, we will avoid his coming judgment of wrath. Sure, it will burn, but it will purify his followers. It will separate, but save those who trust in him. Jesus Christ is your savior, who was born in a manger, now he rules eternally in heaven and he is coming again to judge all the living and the dead. The judgment from our judge, Jesus himself, is not guilty because he has already declared you not guilty by his payment on the cross and fulfilled all the judgment from his father. Because you are not guilty, 
you are separated from eternal condemnation. And your eternal life is secure through Jesus Christ. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard our hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. The Lord be with you. Amen.